be seated. Good to be in the Lord's house this morning. You glad to be here? Say amen. 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 We're glad to see all of you here. If you're visiting with us today, we thank you for coming and being a part of this service. We uh, really praise the Lord for you coming. Pray that you'll make this a regular thing. Amen. I do have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you before we get started. Um, we had our, our men's Bible studies going on right now on Tuesday nights, Kingdom Man. Uh, we'd like to encourage any men that want to come. We've got two more Tuesday nights. Starts at 6.30. Uh, and we would love to have anybody that wants to come, come be a part of that. It's really been a blessing, so come if you can. Uh, also, the youth are going to be participating in the Extreme Winter uh, uh, Student Experience. Uh, it's at Branson, right? Yeah, Branson. Yeah, uh, and so uh, that's going to be a big deal. What, what days is that? Uh, 28, 29, and 30. Yes, 20, that's right. So we didn't get to do camp this year uh, and missed out on a lot of things that we didn't normally get to do, and so this is an opportunity for them to go. Uh, we're really excited about that. It looks like it's going to be some good preaching, too, so we're thankful for that. Uh, and praying uh, for a great experience there, so we'll be praying about that as well. Uh, we do have Children's Church. Anybody like to go to that? They're, they're in the back in the choir room, Miss Kay, Sunday school class. Uh, if anybody would like to go or send your kids there, uh, if you've got an adult that can't act right in church, send them back. Amen. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get them after the service. Uh, uh, also, if you'd like to help with Children's Church, let us know about that, and we look forward to uh, uh, getting everybody in rotation, kind of getting back to normal. It's a blessing to see some, some things coming back uh, to normal. Uh, also, I want to say this to you uh, this morning. This is the Sunday that we use to recognize veterans uh, for Veterans Day. Uh, and I, I made the statement in the early service this morning that we, uh, we, we preach in a lot of churches and go and do revivals and do things like that. And I, I've, I've had a couple sermons I've preached where I would attempt to, to recognize veterans in the service and not have one. And that, that's kind of amazing to me. Uh, to have some churches without veterans in them. And not that it's, I mean, uh, it's not their fault, I don't guess, but I'd tell them, you dirty draft dodgers, <laughs> right? <laughs> but anyway, no, I, uh, I just, it surprised me because it's part of the message kind of, something I was looking forward to making a point <laughs> and then nobody was there. So anyway, I'm thankful for our church, uh, that the Lord has blessed us with some great men and women who have, have given their lives, given their time to serve our nation. And we appreciate that. We'd be remiss this morning. If we didn't take an opportunity to recognize you along with the six or seven, I believe, that we had in the early service this morning, uh, if you are a veteran of the United States Armed Services or you are active duty, we'd like to recognize you this morning. So if you would please stand uh, so that we can do so. We'd love to see you and honor you today, and we thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Amen. Proud of our folks. Amen. And thank God for these veterans and, and for our country. Uh, and for what she means and, and what she's been through. We've been through worse times than we're going through now, I promise you that. Uh, and God's in control, and we're going to pray, and we're going to trust him, and we're going to keep doing what God's called us to do. I know folks are discouraged this morning. I know some folks are kind of down in the mouth, uh, and I know there's some folks that are real happy, and we'll, uh, we'll give you a chance at the invitation to come get that right. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but we are, uh, we're thankful for our nation. Amen. And uh, we're praying that God do a work. And uh, we know that he's able. And Mr. Joe Biden has made the top of my prayer list. Uh, and I will pray for him and, and pray that God will help him uh, and change him and use him and that, uh, and that his, his uh, support people don't kill him because that's their plan. Anyway, all right, enough conspiracies. <laughs> uh, we're praying. Amen. Let's go, Lord, in prayer before I get off into that too much. Uh, i got to save some for the sermon, right? <laughs> Amen. We're glad to have you here, especially visitors. Thank God for you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you today for the privilege to be able to gather, to be able to worship. And God, we pray today uh, that your will be done in this service. We thank you for what you've already done here. And we pray, uh, Lord, for a double portion as we come into this service. Thank you for this good group and pray uh, that you'll bless each one, especially those who are visiting our church today, that you'd bless them and help them, uh, Lord, for coming and being a part of this day with us. We, we thank you for them so much. And uh, God, we pray uh, for those who'll be watching with us as we broadcast our services, uh, Lord, online. We pray that you'll bless each one that... Uh, has a part, uh, Lord, in worshiping and watching along with us. I uh, pray that you'll bless each one of them. God, we pray for our nation this morning. We pray for our president. We pray for the president-elect. Uh, God, that you'd bless these men as they lead our country. And God, uh, whatever the transition, whatever the timeline, uh, we just know that you're going to be in control. And we find rest in that. So we pray uh, that you'd bless us as your people. Give us strength to, to stand and to preach and to do what you've called us to do today. Give us, a, a Lord, a heart to receive and ears to hear and a will to respond to what it is that you'd have us to do. Uh, that your will be done in this service. And I pray that through it all, Jesus Christ be lifted up, be magnified and glorified in this place. We thank you for these veterans. Thank you for the privilege to honor them. And we ask you, Lord, to bless them today as we gather together and worship, uh, Lord, in freedom uh, that their service and their sacrifice has accomplished for us in this nation. Lord, do what you will today. Uh, I, I pray this openly. Lord, just be God. 
And we're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing a couple of verses of my eyes have seen the glory. <laughs> Treasures of me. 
This song is dedicated to all the veterans, your families, and the sacrifice that you've made.
I knew I did my part. You wouldn't blame it on me. <laughs> you have your Bible this morning. Open to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. I have to confess to you this morning that I'm going to preach from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, no, I'm serious. Uh, so uh, enjoy yourself. I hope you got a comfortable spot. <laughs> Revelation 22, when you find it, let's stand as we honor God's word. Revelation 22. We'll read there in verse 13. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I want to use this verse as somewhat of a foundation as we uh, preach a message this morning. And I've heard this word so many times as we talked about politics and talked about elections. And I thought about this, the throne room's incumbent. The one who holds a post or an office. And I want us to think about the one that's on the throne this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you today and we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to come into worship. And God, I pray today that you'd bless each one that's here, each one that hears this message, God, as we celebrate our God. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd use the message today uh, to, to comfort our hearts, but also to challenge us and give us a greater desire to serve you, Lord, to live our lives to please you. Uh, Lord, we thank you today again for the privilege we have to honor and recognize those who have been used of this country, uh, Lord, to protect our freedom. And God, as we celebrate that freedom in free worship and in preaching today, we pray that your will be done. Lord, bless the service. Bless everything that pertains to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I want you to think with me about this as we look to several passages of scripture, and you're welcome to turn along with me. But you know, we've, we've looked at this thing in the election, we've looked at things that's going on in our country, and uh, you know, here we are. <laughs> I, I, I recognize that there's no perfect man in the world, and there's nobody that deserves our absolute uh, allegiance, other than Jesus Christ, amen. But I, I do see some things that are taking place that I'll be honest with you, we've preached for years. We're going to happen. You've heard people say things like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Well, that might be the case. But there's one thing that we find throughout the course of eternity, and that is that God has always been God. Amen. And he's always been faithful. And I find peace in that. I, I find rest in the fact that we can trust our God as we know who he is and we know who he's always been and who he's always going to be. And as we pray for our country and as we go forward as a nation and if nothing changes what will be President Joe Biden we pray for him and we pray for the leadership of this country Amen. God knows what he's doing and whatever it takes to get us to repent whatever it takes to get us on our knees and to recognize who he is and what he's done for us and turn to him we pray that the Lord's will be done in our country but I do find rest this morning and I find peace in the fact that the throne room is occupied that the throne is forever occupied. It always has been and it always will be. That we go through heartache and we go through hardship. And I don't mean to be a discourager this morning or the bearer of bad news, but there's more coming. You're going to go through trying times. We're going to go through challenges. And no matter who the president is and no matter what party is represented, there's going to come a day in this country we're going to find out who really believes this book. We're going to find out who's really willing to stand for it, who's willing to hold on to it. Who's willing to believe it? Who's willing to, to, to preach it and live by it, even when it's not popular or even illegal? We're going to stand in a day one day in this country that it's going to be a lot harder to do what we do than it is now. And that's why we take advantage of the liberty that we've been given to live our lives right now to please him. <coughs> Excuse me. To live our lives to serve and to honor the Lord as we've been given this opportunity. So as we consider a few things this morning, and you don't have to turn along with me because I don't want to... I don't want to take as much time as it would probably take for you to do so, but I do want you to keep up with us, and maybe if you keep notes, you can look at this after. Uh, and again, you're welcome to turn along with us. But I want us to notice a few areas this morning as we consider this incumbency of the throne room, as we consider the Lord sitting on his throne. First of all, I want you to notice with me in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Most Baptists can find that one. I want you to know that he was God in creation. He was God in creation. The Bible says this, in the beginning, God 
created the heaven and the earth. I want you to understand that this was not the beginning of God. This was our beginning from God. This is not where God came on the scene. This is where the scene came about to God. We can't wrap our minds around the eternal nature of God and how He's always been and how He always will be, but the reality is He's an eternal God. And so as He's always been and He always will be, it's a beautiful thing to consider that He has no predecessor. He has no successor. There will be none who came before Him that can speak uh, of preeminence. There will be none who come after Him. He is forever God. And so in creation, when the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, we see that God was God in creation, that God was there. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 3 that all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So we can take comfort in the fact that everything we see and everything that we know has been brought about and given to us by the hand of Almighty God, and He's not going to change. You're not going to impeach Him. He's not going to be voted out. He can't, he can't be forced to resign. He is and forever will be God. He is our incumbent God. He is the one who sits on the throne. He is God in creation, in everything that we know, in everything that we see. He is and He was and He will be God. Now throughout the course of the Bible, we find many instances where God has showed Himself faithful. God has showed Himself to His people and revealed Himself many times. Now I'll say this, in the creation account, there was nobody there to see that. So there was nobody there to say that they saw Him. But we trust the Word of God that says what it says. But as you go through Scripture, you find different instances, different prophets, different kings, different priests, different leaders, different groups, different nations, as we recognize God showing Himself throughout the ages. I studied in my heart and, and tried to prepare for the message this week, praying, God, give me something to help our people. Give me something to be a blessing to somebody. I, I don't want to just stir the pot. I don't want to sing the old gloom, despair, and agony on me. I, I want to be a blessing to people and try to help our folks as we consider everything that's going on in our world today. And I, I, I considered Jeremiah, and I looked at Isaiah and Jeremiah as I considered the Babylonian captivity of the people of God. And I read a summary of the book of Jeremiah, just an introductory phrase, and I thought this was so telling that he made the statement that in the time of Jeremiah, the people of God thought that they were so endowed with the favor of God that they could do whatever they wanted and still have the hand of God on them. And so Jeremiah cried against a nation that you can't live in sin and expect God to continue His favor and His blessing in your life. You can't live however you want to and expect, expect the blessing of God on your people. And as we find ourselves in a day that it's very much said the same in the church. It's said the same in our community. It's said the same in our nation. That we as a people who can cling to our Christian heritage all we want to. We can cling to our foundation all we want to. But who are we to expect as we live in a day of celebrated sin? A day of the celebration of abomination in our country. Who are we to expect God to keep His hand on us or to continue to bless us with His favor? Now you say what you want to about presidential candidates. But when Donald Trump won the White House, they were in front of the White House waving American flags and Donald Trump flags. But when Joe Biden won the White House, they were waving a big rainbow flag, celebrating their sin, advancing the cause of their sin. It's a shame to me that they hijacked the rainbow. Amen? Amen? That was God's before it was theirs. Does anybody remember that? Amen. Yet there they were, waving their rainbow flag, celebrating their sin. And listen, one sin's no different than the other. I'm not here to tell you that one sinner is worse than another sinner, but we have to possess in the church the ability and the right and the fortitude to continue to preach the truth at all costs to do what God has called us to do. I got saved because somebody came and preached against my sin. Because the only way I could realize I was a sinner is somebody had to identify my sin. Somebody began to talk about something that I had been doing. Things that I had said. Things that I had done. And then I realized, hang on, sinners are not just them. I'm a part of this mess too. And so as we preach, we preach the whole counsel of God. And the whole counsel of God doesn't call nobody. But the way that we are able to communicate to people in their sin that they're sinners is we have to call their sin by name. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the agendas that are being pushed in this country are nothing less than an abomination. And we find ourselves today looking, wondering, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to trust God. We're going to do what God's called us to do. We're going to recognize that He is and forever will be on His throne. Amen. We trust Him today. We believe God today. We hold to God today. We cling to God today because He is the incumbent of the throne room and He ain't going nowhere. Amen. Amen. So in Isaiah chapter 6, I want you to see that not only was God God in creation, 
But I want you to see also that God is God in crisis. The Bible says in Isaiah 6, Isaiah writes, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting high upon his throne, or sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain covered their face. Twain covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I want you to understand that in this day, you have a man named Uzziah, who was the tenth in line king of Judah. As this king of Judah, he was a man who believed God. He was a good king. He was one who trusted the Lord. He was one who served God with his life. And I read this as a, as a, a commentator wrote about Uzziah. And I thought, what an epitaph this would be for any of us. I, I would pray that at the, at the end of the church, as we go from 1899 to the day God calls us home, I pray this could be what would be said about the Antioch Baptist Church as this was written about King Uzziah. Listen, very simply it says that he faithfully believed God to the end. I wish that would be my testimony. I hope when they lay me to rest one day, I, I hope that it can be said that I believed God and I served God and I honored God all of my days. Till the end of my life, I did what God called me to do. In this day, they had to say goodbye to a leader. One that they loved. One that they trusted. One that they really respected and that they were free to follow. And in this, as they said goodbye to Uzziah their king, Isaiah looked up and he saw the Lord. When he looked up, he saw the Lord, and the Bible said that God was on his throne, and the glory of his train filled the temple, and you see this scene that's put together. This is a scene, if you know this passage, that led to the conversion of the prophet Isaiah, who would become one of the great prophets of all of Scripture. But Isaiah, in this experience, recognizes a few things, and the Bible teaches us this, that Isaiah saw God. When he saw God, he was sitting on his throne, and then in that experience, Isaiah saw himself. As he saw himself, he recognized that there was a need. And when he saw that need, he surrendered his life to Christ. I want you to understand today that we have to take our eyes off of the Oval Office. And we have to take our eyes off the White House. And we have to take our eyes even higher than the moon and the sun and the stars and the sky and the atmosphere. And I want to draw your attention all the way to the throne room in heaven. And I want you to recognize that even in creation, God was God. Even in crisis, whatever your crisis may be, Whatever your heartache may be, whatever your challenge may be, your trial may be, whatever your sin may be, whatever your sorrow is today, I need you to know today and believe today and trust today that God is on His throne. He is in total control. He has never been less than wonderful. He is absolutely, teetotally sovereign and nobody's going to bring Him down. Amen. Isaiah looked up and he said, I saw the Lord. I want you to notice this theme as we go through the next few points. Recognize that Isaiah... To see one that's high and lifted up, you can't look down. Amen? To see one high and lifted up, you got to look up. To be able to see them and recognize who they are. Listen, in creation, He was God. In crisis, He was, He is, and He forever will be God. We'll go to the New Testament. I skipped a few books. I know you didn't want me to go all the way from Genesis to Revelation, right? In the book of Acts in chapter 7, you read a story about a man named Stephen. Let me tell you a little bit about Stephen. Stephen was a Jewish deacon to the church. In Acts chapter 6, he was recognized as a deacon. Now, have you ever had something real good happen to you, and then you knew that something bad was going to happen? That's just kind of how it goes, isn't it? it? You buy a new truck, you can drive an old truck for 10 years and it won't scratch it, not one time. You buy a new truck and give it a week. Somebody's going, you can park 8 miles from Walmart, and somebody's going to pull up with a 4-year-old that's full of sugar, and he's going to sling that door open, and you got your first ding. Amen? You got a scratch, you got something. It's always going to be something. You're going to have to deal with something. If you ever got ahead financially, get ready, right? Something's coming. You get ahead financially, the air's going to go out. Somebody's going to lose something. You, you, you're going to have a flat tire. Something's going, I mean, you, you, I'm not trying to be discouraging. I'm just talking to real people, am I not? And we just go through stuff like this. And so you go along and life's full of this kind of stuff. Life's full of trouble. Well, let me tell you a very terrible situation. Stephen, in Acts chapter 6, becomes a deacon, a servant, a, a leader in the church. He's one who preached the gospel fearlessly, the Bible teaches us. And he was called by God to go and preach the kingdom of God to the Jews. What they're trying to do is to convert this nation. They're trying to change these people, their understanding, their mindset. They had missed the Messiah. They had missed 
Jesus. And so they're preaching to them in the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is who the Bible said He is. He died for your sin. He laid in that grave for three days. And up from the grave, He arose. And He's alive today. And He'll save you today. And He'll change you today. And you can be changed and saved by the Messiah and have a home in heaven. And so Stephen goes preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God to all of these Jews. And it made them so mad. You know why it makes people mad to hear the truth? Because the truth will change you. People don't want to change. They were so mad that they stoned him to death for preaching the gospel. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55 that this same Stephen, the Bible says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up, did you hear that? He looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw, what did he see? The glory of God and Jesus standing on his right hand. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He looked and he saw the throne. And he saw God. And he saw the glory of God. And right beside the glory of God was the Lord Jesus Christ standing. And the Bible goes on and says in verse 56 that Stephen said, And behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man is standing on the right hand hand of God and listen to what the liberals did in verse 57 it, tell me this don't sound like a bunch of liberals verse 57 then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears he's talking about how good God is he saw the glory of God and Jesus Christ the one who they're saying did not exist and what they do blah, 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 blah. like a bunch of three year olds is that not how they act parading around up and down the streets. They want to condemn a man for having a rally because there's a virus and then they're out in the street high-fiving and hugging and huddling and waving the rainbow flag. <laughs> Hypocrisy is what my black preacher friend called it. Amen? Hypocrisy. They plugged their ears. What a bunch of weenies. Plugged their ears and started chirping because they didn't want to hear Stephen giving God glory and recognizing Jesus. So they plugged their ears and they didn't say anything though they couldn't hear it. They screamed and cried out with a loud voice and they ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. That's what happened to Stephen. But you know what happened in the midst of it? Stephen didn't look at the rock chunkers. Stephen didn't look at the political turmoil. Stephen didn't look at the world. Stephen looked up. And you know what he saw when he looked up? That everything was just fine in the throne room. God was on the throne and Jesus was right there beside him. Now there's a hundred theological rabbits that could be chased about why Jesus was standing. That's another sermon for another day. But the reality is when he looked up, he saw Jesus. When he looked up, he saw God. And he recognized that the incumbent in the throne room was right there in his place. And he always will be. He was God in creation. He's God in crisis. He's God in calamity. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know your heartache or your burden or your sorrow. But I want you to know and find rest in this. God's God. And He cares for you. He loves you. And listen, things are going to change. A guy said this right one time. Life is full of swift transition. Sometimes you think things are a certain way and then they're not. <laughs> you, you find comfort in the things of this world. But let me tell you what John said. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. Because when we fall in love with this world, the world controls us. It controls the narrative. We need to recognize that this world is not our home as believers. That this world is just a place we're passing through. We're on a pilgrimage this morning. We're here to glorify God. We're here to meet Jesus and do what He's called us to do. But this is not our destination. This is not our home. This is, listen, we're just here in this earthly tabernacle for just a moment. And then one day this earthly tabernacle is going to fall away and decay and be gone. And when it is and when it does, I'll walk you to the cemetery and show you that from the first one we buried, God was God. And when they put us in the ground, He's going to be God. And listen, until the day is coming, until it's come and gone he'll ever be on his throne Amen. we can trust him and because of that we worship him because of that we serve him I told people last Sunday there was two options in this election that were going to affect the church one of two ways either it was going to stay a little bit easier to do what God called us to do or it was going to get a little bit harder to do what God called us to do but either way we're going to do what God called us to do Amen. Amen? Amen. we're not running we're not scared we're not backing down. What we're going to find out is, is that God's faithful. Amen. Amen. 
No matter what this world says, the world's always been anti-God. Come on. So we're going to trust Him. And we're going to put a smile on our face. Enjoy in our hearts. We're going to come in here and sing. We're going to come in here and preach. And we're going to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And we're going to keep trying to reach our community. And we're going to keep praying for our nation. And we're going to keep supporting missionaries. And we're going to keep backing evangelists. And we're going to keep spreading the gospel. We're going to keep, as the old hymn says, sending the light. Even the gospel light. Why? Because he's God even in calamity. Even in heartache. Even in hardship. Even in the down times. Even in the times you can't see him. Even in the times you can't feel him. Even in the times you can't hear him. He's still God. Because the book says he's God. And we hold this in our heart. To believe this book. And we hold it near because this is our source and our force and our course as the people of God. He is the incumbent of the throne room and he will not and shall not be removed. And we ought to find happiness in that, joy in that. We ought to shout a little bit about that, amen? And just give God glory because he can't be moved. Everything in this world is going to change. Can anybody that's been here a while tell us that things change? Things change. This world does not look like it did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it didn't look like it did 20 years before that. Amen. Amen. We're going to keep doing what God's called us to do. I sure find comfort in this book, in knowing that there's one absolute in this room. You know, 100 years from now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but 100 years from now, you all going to be dead. I'll still be here pastor. <laughs> and me and whoever's here. Amen. Let me tell you something. This book's still going to be true. God's still going to be God. We'll be around the throne shouting, singing. You're going to sing in heaven. You don't want to sing here for whatever reason. You're going to sing in heaven. Amen. Amen. All that holy holy grunting and mumbling you do here, that ain't going to go in heaven. You're going to rear back and sing. Now, I get it. You can't sing that good here, and we appreciate that. So keep mumbling. When you get to heaven, you're going to have a good voice. So you can sing when you get to heaven. Right now, just keep mumbling. We feel you. God knows your heart. Amen. We know your voice. So mumble, mumble. Amen. But for the rest of you, keep singing. Listen, we're going to sing. We're going to preach. We're going to shout. And when we get around the throne, it's just going to get better. And we're going to do it. And as long as God is God, this world is going to be under His sovereign control. He's in control. And sometimes God has to allow us to go through some things. And I want to remind you of something. In this election, you want to celebrate America. You think about the, the, the democratic process. What a privilege it is to be able to go to the polls and be able to cast our vote for the, uh, for the political figure of our choice. We live in a country much different than many others. There were people that aren't even alive still that got to vote in this election. Some people got to vote twice. Some people got to vote in a state they don't even live in. Amen. What a country. <laughs> Chaos. Uncertainty. Fear. But God's on his throne. And I ain't backing up. We're just going to keep doing what God's told us to do. I don't like how things go sometimes. But you know what? Things don't ever go really the way we want them to, do they? <laughs> I mean, things always just, it seems like there's always something. Is that not right? Always something. And see, th th this, this, this preaching that's crept into our world, and especially in our country, that if you do right and live right, and especially if you give your money, that everything's going to go good for you and go right for you, that's a lie. That's not true because we're sinners. We're going to hit roadblocks. We're going to have stumps. There are going to be hurdles in our way. What do we do? Give up and cry? I'm like Leonard Ravenhill said. I got the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and two-thirds of the angels on my side. What do you want me to do? Give up? Amen. We're going to keep serving God and do what God has called us to do. Why? Because He was God in creation. He's God in crisis. He's God in calamity. Listen to me. Number four. Does that scare you? Hebrews chapter 12. He's God in the midst of our contending. As we contend to do what God's called us to do. He's on the throne doing what He's always done. Paul writes this. Wherefore seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us and run with patience the race that's set before us. Hear this now. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He penned the first word. There was no preface. Nobody could have written the preface because He's God. He penned the first word. He put the final punctuation on the book. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He is not backed up on that. He constitutes our faith. Looking to the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, listen, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. While we contend, he's God. Some of you are contending for your marriage. 
Some of you contending for your family. Some are contending for our kids. We're contending for our community. We're contending for the relevancy and for the influence of our church. We want to help people. We want to be a lighthouse. We want to shine. Amen. We want people to know the Lord. We're contending for our nation. We're contending for this land. We're contending for this world to endeavor to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we contend, he tells us to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know what we need to do? We need to look up. We need to look up. Get our eyes back on the Lord and recognize, listen, Peter, Peter's in the boat. Jesus said, come to me. When Peter stepped out, he stepped out on the promise of the word of God. And you know what Peter was doing? He was walking on water. Ain't nobody done that that I can recollect except him and Jesus. He stepped out, walking on that water, but he took his eyes off of Jesus. And you know what happened when he took his eyes off of Jesus? He recognized something. That the wind and the waves, the Bible said, were tumultuous around him. But let me tell you something. Those waves are still rolling and the wind is still blowing. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can do exactly what he's called us to do and stand on his word. And if we take our eyes off and if we stumble and we fall, because we tend to do that occasionally, do we not? Amen. Uh, occasionally. Quite regularly, do we not? Amen. Sometimes we stumble and fall. Sometimes we just jump off. Amen. <laughs> Because we cray-cray. Anybody in the house want to give me a witness right there? Any married men want to speak to the cray-cray nature? Of the <laughs> Amen. Amen. Things get wild sometimes, don't they? And a lot of times, I don't know if you're willing to admit this this morning, but allow me to be the scapegoat. I'm my own worst enemy. I get myself in trouble. You've seen me do it. <laughs> Amen. This morning, you've seen us do it. We get ourselves in trouble. We mess up. We stumble. We fall. But we've got to get up and keep going. We've got to contend to do what God's called us to do and recognize that all the while he's there. You know what happened when Peter started to sink? Jesus said, you big idiot, why in the world did you take your eyes off of me? I hope you drown. That's not what Jesus said. Peter said, Lord, save me. And you know what Jesus did? He reached out and saved him. There's going to be times it feels like the, head's going to get, the water's going to get over our head. Can I remind you that the waves that are over our head are still under his feet? That we can hold to his unchanging hand. We can believe the Lord today. We can stand on the whole counsel of the word of God and we can recognize even as we contend for our family. We contend for the hope that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We contend for the good of our, of our homes and our nation. We can contend knowing that the God that we serve and the God that we belong to is still on his throne, high and lifted up, and he can be trusted. Y'all ready for the last one? You want me to put a couple more in there? <laughs> Revelation chapter 4. Not only was he God in creation and God in crisis, God in calamity, God in our contending, I want you to see that in Revelation chapter 4 that he's God in the close. He's God in closing. The beginning and the end. Now, if you go in the book of Revelation, you'll study what's a, a study of the seven churches of Asia Minor. And in this study of these seven churches, what you find is that John... You were talking about somebody that suffered. Of the 12 disciples, John was the only disciple that showed up at the cross. Of the 12 apostles, John was the only one that was not martyred for the faith. John, however, don't you think he got off easy? John was boiled in a vat of oil for his preaching of the gospel. Having been boiled in the vat of oil and surviving, which I believe he may have took martyrdom over having to live with what being boiled in oil had to do to his body, John was exiled to a place called the Isle of Patmos. On the Isle of Patmos, he separated, isolated, no friends, no family, no help, no counselor. It was just him. But it was in that moment that God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ. John wrote in the first three chapters of these seven churches. These seven churches prophetically represent to us the seven eras of the church. And as we come to the close of the church era in Laodicea, you find at the closing of Laodicea a time in church history where Jesus Christ is literally on the outside looking in. The Bible says Jesus is at the door, standing and knocking. 
saying to them, if anybody will hear my voice and let me in, I'll come in and have fellowship with him. There will be revival, and I'll be with him, and he'll be with me. Yet nobody responds. And even in that darkest hour, we find something that takes place. Jesus said back in the Gospel of Matthew, no man knows the day or the hour. Well, at this dark day of the church, when the church is more concerned with entertainment, when the church is more concerned with pleasing people, when the church is more concerned with, with making you comfortable instead of making you converted, the Bible says in this transition into chapter 4, John, I'm not going to say this because we believe this. I'm going to say this because it's biblically accurate. John is a picture here of the rapture of the church. At the conclusion of Revelation 3 and turn into Revelation chapter 4, listen to the verbiage that John uses. After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither. <laughs> and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, listen to what he says. A throne was, in set, was set in heaven. Can I tell you this? Over 150 passages in the Bible have the word throne. In the Bible, 39 times, that's in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, 12 times that you find the word throne is here in chapter 4. He goes on and says this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, chapter or verse 2, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. Buddy, when I read that, <laughs> it sent a tingle up my spine because when he looks and sees this throne and he sees this one that sat on it it spoke to my heart that this is the one that was on it in creation this was the one that was on it in crisis this is the one that was on it in calamity this is the one that was on it during our contending he was on the throne. One. Not two. Not three. Not another. But one. The same one who always was. The same one who is. And the same one who always will be. He saw this one who was sitting on the throne. And the Bible says in verse 3, The one that sat on it to look upon him was like a jasper, like a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne. Remember the rainbow was God's? Before the... Before all right. Round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And he said, round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was as a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord. God, what a scene. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And then those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him and they that sat on the throne, to him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, listen to this, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they were created. He was God in creation. You know the others. And He's God at the conclusion. He's God at the closing. There's going to be a lot of things changed. There's a lot of things that's changed from Genesis 1 until now. Through it all, He's been God. And He will be God. Here's my comfort. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. I'm glad I'm saved today. There are a lot of things that worry me. I'm a thinker. And I love people. And people are kind of the worst. <laughs> 
believe it was Mark Twain that said, you can pick up a dog and feed him and take care of him and he'll never bite you. Too bad you can't say that about people. People will hurt you. But I love people. And loving people and caring for people, it makes you worry. And you look at things and recognize things, raising kids will make you worry. Somebody gets pregnant with their first kid, I'll always tell them, prepare to be worried for the rest of your life. Amen? Amen. You worry. We care. That's why. We want our kids to have it good. We want our grandkids to have it good. We want them to be able to work and provide for their families and live in a nation where it's okay to worship Jesus. That's what we want. We want hope, and that's the hope of the gospel. But in the midst of tumultuous times, heartaches and sorrows, I'm sure glad I can pillow my head at night and say I know that my sins are forgiven. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm right with God. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you're going through today. But if you're a believer, you can find comfort in this. I belong to Jesus, and he's going to take care of me. Whatever the outcome, I know it's going to be all right because I belong to the Lord. And here's what's good about the Lord. We can put our hope in people. We can put our hope in pastors, presidents, deacons, leaders, individuals, parents. But what we find is they all have the capacity to fail us. They all have the capacity to let us down. And even if they don't, one day they're going to leave us. I'll never forget the day they called me from South Carolina and told me Brother Paul had passed. And I put a post on Facebook and made the statement that there's not a lot of people that die that you immediately feel like the world is a worse place because of their absence. That's exactly the way I felt when I lost Brother Paul. When we lose those people that we love, but I can sure find comfort even in loss, even in sorrow, in knowing I'm going to be with him again. And I know that that's never going to change. And I'm thankful for that. And here's how I know that that's never going to change. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, Jesus speaking says, I'm Alpha and I'm Omega. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. I'm the first and the last. Trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me. Now, if you're saved today, I want you to find your comfort in the Lord. I want you to know that God's God and he's able. And whatever you're going through, I want you to know that he can take care of you. And I hope that that motivates something in you to be able to continue to serve him, no matter what happens. If you don't know him today, I pray you come right now. Right this moment, this very hour, give your heart to Jesus. Come serve the Lord. Buddy, we live in a day, don't we? Pandemics, viruses. Some people get the virus. We had it. It was mild. Some people get it and never get over it. It's incredible how this thing has hit our country. We live in a day with pandemic, political uncertainty, economic ups and downs. We don't know what to trust. We don't know who to turn to. We don't know what to believe anymore. There seems to be no absolutes. I feel so sorry for these kids, man. There's so much... Challenging times going on in their lives, things that they shouldn't even have to be thinking about. Amen. But they do. But I want to tell you something. If you're in here without Jesus today, there's something far beyond this world you better be worried about. And that's where you're going to spend eternity. Could there be anything worse than surviving this world and then the day you die, spend an eternity in a place called hell? When you can fight the fights of this world and you can live the lives and suffer the loss and cry the tears and go through the struggles and get to the end of this and step off into eternity and be with Jesus, the Alpha, the Omega, the incumbent King forever. You can have that if you're saved today. You can get it today if you're not. I'm glad that I know no matter what happens, my God reigns. He's on his throne and I'm just going to stick with him. Amen. And I pray that you'll do the same. You know what we got to do? You know what Isaiah did? Wasn't nobody there in Genesis 1. But Isaiah looked up. And he saw the Lord. You know what Stephen did? When they started throwing stones at him. When they took him captive because of what he was preaching. He looked up. You know what he noticed? Everything was just fine. <laughs> when Paul writes that letter to us in contending for the faith. He said look up. Look at Jesus. He'll help you. And John, in the Revelation, he looked up. And you know what he saw? No matter what was going on on this earth, everything in heaven was just like the Bible says it was. It was just fine. 
That's home. Until we get there, we anchor our peace in that. If you need to be saved today, listen to this preacher. You can be saved today. You ought to come. Let's don't go through one more battle without it. Karen Peck wrote a song. My friend Randa Jordan sang it, the stars down with it. If everybody's going through something, I'd rather go through something with him. Listen, I don't know what you're going through, but it's going to be a whole lot better for you to go through it with Jesus. If you don't know him, you ought to come to him this morning. And if you know him, you ought to say, God, help me. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. Give me your presence so that I can get over the discouragement, get over the down nature of this whole world and put my eyes back on Jesus and recognize everything's going to be all right. You come if you need to come this morning. Y'all stand with us. Father, we love you. Lord, we want to thank you today for your love for us. We thank you for the privilege we have to come to minister, Lord, to worship. I pray today, Lord, that you'd bless this invitation. If for somebody here that needs to be saved, I pray they'd have the grace to come and get it settled once and for all. Lord, maybe there's somebody here today that's saved, but they're struggling. Maybe they've allowed the things of this world to overcome their faith, to overcome their heart, and to overwhelm them, and they just need some help. I pray you'd help us to see, Lord, that just like David said, that the Lord is a very present help in times of trouble. Lord, that you're there for us, our refuge, our fortress, our shield. God, I pray if there's somebody that has a need in here today, they'd come to you to have that need met, especially if there's one that needs to be saved. Let them come and be saved today. But God, for your people, I pray you revive our hearts and show us, God, that we've got work to do. And as long as you're on the throne, which I believe we've served uh, or seen today, will be forever that we have a purpose in this life. And we got to do what you told us to do. Help us to be the church. Bless your invitation. We're going to thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You come if you need to come this morning. This altar be open. If you need to be saved, you